I'd like to read the first verse of our scripture reading as we get started this morning. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. This is one of the first verses that I memorized after John 3, 16. Luke 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Jesus had the custom of fellowship and worship on Sabbath. That was his upbringing. That was his custom. Jesus had spent his early years in Nazareth. His father was Joseph, a man of great repute, no doubt, in that little city. And Jesus himself must have been known in that little town very well. His excellent character and conduct must have have attracted others to him must have attracted notice. In due due time, he leaves Nazareth, was baptized by John in the Jordan, and began preaching and working great wonders. His friends and acquaintances in Nazareth must have said said to one another, one of these days he's going to come home to Nazareth, right? And visit us. And And then we can see him. And when he comes... We'll go and hear what the carpenter's son has to say. There's always an interest when one of the lads of the village becomes a preacher, and this interest was heightened by the hope of seeing the wonders that they were hearing about, the miracles, right? Maybe he would make Nazareth famous. Maybe he would settle down and and be the great physician of Nazareth. And people would be drawn to us By and by, when the famous prophet comes to his own city, the Sabbath was approaching. Will he be at the... You know, the word must have buzzed out through the the village. Uh, Will he be at the synagogue, someone says, so that we can all see him? And yes, he comes on Sabbath morning. And the ruler of the synagogue shares the common opinion. And when he sees Jesus come in, Come in, he takes the roll from the prophet Isaiah, passes it to Jesus, and invites him to read the passage. No sleepy people in church today. They've been anticipating this. Jesus reverently takes the scroll and unrolls it as one who is accustomed to doing it. And he quickly finds the passage, not just any passage, but the passage which describes the work which he was called, had been called upon to do. Wow. These words are his own mission statement. You know, mission statements are more effective if they're very short, right? I've seen mission statements that take two or three pages, and I, do, I read about the first two paragraphs. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> par- uh, mission statements are much more effective if they're short and to the point. Let's read the mission statement. It's Luke chapter 4, 18, 19, and part of verse 20. As he stands up to read, this is what he says to that congregation that day. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. It's remarkable about what he did not read. Where Jesus read from was from Isaiah 61. Let's turn to Isaiah 61. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has appointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison that 
to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the what does it say next? The day of vengeance. Jesus didn't read that part. Interesting. The day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. He stops in the middle of the sentence to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and then he stops. The passage is not complete unless you read the words in the day of vengeance of our God. He doesn't read those last words. These were his first words to the Nazarenes, the people of Nazareth. Wisely, he didn't want to talk in threatening words, but words of peace, gentle words, hopeful words, gospel words. His heart's desire was that they all might be saved, that he might win some. And instead of a day of vengeance, it might be to them the acceptable year of the Lord. That was his goal. That was Christ's method. He leaves out the severe words at the beginning. Some of the most severe words in all the Bible is in the three angel messages. Were you aware of that? Some of the most severe words in all the Bible is in the third angel's message. Days of vengeance. Why don't we leave off the first message, the first angel's message, which is the everlasting gospel and, and uh, you know, those kind of words? which is about the everlasting, and start with the mark of the beast. That's what the third angel's message is about. Why don't we start there instead of the, the good words? He talked about restoring sight to the blind people, healing the brokenhearted, preaching the gospel to the poor, releasing captives. The mark of the beast comes to people only after this is soundly rejected. After the message of the first angel is soundly rejected, then we talk about the mark of the beast, right? That comes later, as the mark of the beast is about to be urged upon people. Our first, pro 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 our first approach should be to preach good tidings, glad tidings. This is a time, there's a time and place to talk of vengeance of our God. And these people of Nazareth were wonderstruck. Wouldn't you have liked to have heard the good news right directly from the lips of Jesus as he wrote the, wrote the, read the words from Isaiah? He read this passage, which he himself had authored some hundred years, 700 years before. He read with such force, so simply, and yet so nobly, so much so that all their eyes were fixed on him as he was reading, and everyone was astonished. He spoke in the first person as if he were fulfilling the prophecy himself. And that must have sunk into their consciousness as they, heard, as they heard him read. And everyone was astonished. Soon there was a buzz went around through the congregation. Each man said to his fellow, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his name called Mary, or his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James and Joseph? But these were messianic words. Why then did this man say these things? Do they know that they spoke of himself? They were astonished. And they were envious. You know, envy is a terrible thing. But Jesus didn't come here to astonish people or make them envious, but to impress hearts with the character of God. All of his ministry was pointed Godward to put on full display the character of our God. You know what? That's our work too. I read someplace that the last message of mercy to this world will be a revelation of what? Say it with me. The character of God, right? That's the best kept secret in all the world. What God is truly and really like. These were wonderful things that he had spoken of. Pearls, if you will. But he sensed that he was only throwing these pearls before swine. So he speaks more pointedly, more personally, somewhat more cuttingly. When he says, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears, in your hearing. And that did it. 
He wasn't speaking parables anymore. Notice his words. Luke chapter 4, 23 to 27. Back to Luke 4 again. Luke 4, 23 to 27. And he said to them, you will, you will surely say to me this proverb, Fish, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have done in Capernaum, do also here in, the, in your country. And verse 25, but I tell you a truth. Even the widows of Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when the great famine was throughout the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent, save to Setra, the city of Sidon, to a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel at the time of Elisha. None of them were cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. This excited the anger of the whole congregation. Their eyes began to glare like the eyes of beasts. They rose up at once to slay him. The curiosity of yesterday had turned into the indignation of today. Yesterday, they welcomed the prophet. Today, they said, crucify him. Today, crucify him, crucify him. They didn't say that. That was too good. Notice what happens in verses 28 and 29. Luke 4, 28 and 29. And all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city, led him to the brow of a hill whereon the city was built, that they might cast him headlong. Down into the rocks, no doubt. So they drag him out of the synagogue, breaking up the worship service, forgetful of the holiness of the Sabbath day, and they cast him forth into the lofty rocks of the cliff. And uh, he escapes harm. Notice verse 30. It says, and he passing through the midst of them went his way. Isn't that neat? Through the midst of them and went his way. They were astonished at what was happening too. What a termination of such a wonderful beginning. Here was the best preacher in the whole world of all time, literally. And one of the most desirable audiences of people who were attentive. No one sleeping that day. Every ear was open. Every mouth is, is open as he begins. Eyes were as big as cantaloupes. Such expectancy of what he would say. Maybe there will be innumerable conversions here today. <laughs> but maybe Nazareth will become the great stronghold of Christianity. But no such thing. Such is the perversity of fallen human nature. Where we expect much sometimes and we get so little. The field that should be producing hundredfold of wheat brings forth only weeds and thorns and thistles. We may say, oh, I would never do that. I would never say such a thing and reject Christ in that way. Several questions here. Who are these rejectors of the way, the truth, and the life? Second question might be, why this rejection, even with such soft touches as Jesus brought to them that day? No mark of the beast here it was for a starter. It was very the softest touch that Jesus could have made to the Nazarenes that day. And what came of it? Let's start with the first one. Who are these rejectors? There was a whole congregation of them, apparently. They were of one accord. I like united churches, don't you? <laughs> But this is the wrong way to be united. They united against who? The king of the universe. The one who is the creator of the universe. Are there any like that in our present day? Even in the church or maybe on the fringe of the church. Uh, this is a time for us to talk to each other, right? To me, to, to me my, I need it as much as you do. Is there wholehearted acceptance of Jesus in spite of adversity or, or pro or prosperity. These people in Nazareth were the closest related to Jesus of all the people in the world. He grew up among them. 
They knew him intimately. He grew up there in their midst as a tender plant. He came to his own, the Bible says, and his own did what? Received him not. But why? There are many, perhaps even among us, who like King Agrippa are almost persuaded to be Christians. You know, I have to look at myself. The Bible says that we should examine ourselves to see if we are in the what? In the faith. And faith has a what? An object. And in the Christian world, that is the object is Jesus Christ, right? Perhaps all of us could rationally ask like Judas, is it me? He was with Jesus for three and a half years. Saw all the good things he did. Now, if they were almost persuaded, they are the closest connected to Christ of any living on the face of the earth at that point. The Nazarenes. But they weren't even almost persuaded. They were totally unpersuaded that day. And even almost is a dangerous place to be. You would expect that the almosts would be the easiest people to reach. But they're not. All of us who have done some missionary work find out that the almosts are the ones that bring the most difficulty in outreach, bringing people to Jesus. I want to make a close application here this morning. I speak these words to myself. I need this message as much as anyone in this congregation. I live in the same marketplace as you do. Those people of Nazareth knew more about Jesus than any other people in the whole world. They were well acquainted with his mother and the rest of his relatives. They knew Christ's whole pedigree. They could tell at once that Joseph and Mary were the tribe of Judah. They probably knew about his miracle birth and why they first went to Bethlehem and then their trip to Egypt. The whole story of, his one, of this wondrous child were known to them. They didn't know the rudiments. They didn't need the rudiments, I should say. They didn't need the rudiments of the Christian faith, the basics of his existence. Thus they should have been very hopeful that people for Jesus to preach to. What about us? Many of us know the very, very wonderful truths of the gospel. Some of us have known it from childhood, right? I can remember probably back to four years of age. I remember the picture rules, roles in Sabbath school, right? And more than that, the doctrines are well understood by, by many of us to perhaps all or at least most of us, the Bible is not a dark and mysterious book, but very believable and relevant. Many are able even to teach others, many of us. George Whitfield, you've heard of George Whitfield, the great evangelist of the 1700s. There was a great re religious awakening going on in England. There was a powerful evangelist named George Whitfield, and he had great successes in reaching people. But it is said that he preached the gospel to people who never heard it before. <laughs> the message, the masses of England were the people that came to hear him preach, people who were not familiar with scripture. And to them, the gospel was a very, very new thing. The simplest gospel, believe and live, he preached. Look and live had been replaced in the established church of the day with liturgy and pomp and circumstance. They built cathedrals in that time. This was the Sardis church of Earth's history, mid 1700s. Uh, actually, from the 1600s to the mid 1700s. And now this great religious revival, revival was sweeping England. When the gospel came from Whitfield's lips, it was crisp and fresh to all of them. Tens of thousands responded 
to the purest gospel as though it were fresh manna from the skies. Those people were not almost persuaded. They'd never heard it before. You know, it's, it's very easy sometimes to find a willing heart. And it's almost like a white blank piece of paper. You, you know, this is the first time they heard it. <laughs> Isn't that neat? I just love that. Sometimes that happens. And they accept everything that you, that you tell them because it right, comes right directly to the Bible. We should be very Bible-centered, right? Everything we should, send, we should teach should be fresh from the Bible. They came to his meetings by the, they came forward in his meeting. When he had a call, a call for, for, for repentance, they would come forward by the hundreds. These people were not almost persuaded, but enthusiastic for Jesus. But those people in Nazareth were gospel hardened. That's a, that's a phrase I heard several years ago, gospel hardening. Could, is that possible that could happen to me? It becomes so commonplace that the real roots, the wharf and roof of Christianity does not reach my heart. I hate to think that, you know, as we take lessons from door to door, that we're just filling, filling minds with information that does not reach the heart. But then I wonder sometimes about myself. And I tell you what, I pray for this congregation every day. May we have a heart connection with the message that we, that we present. Those people in Nazareth were gospel hardened. The angles and corners of truth were worn off. These were people who thought they had a claim, on, claim to Christ. By contrast, in our day, 300,000 people were baptized in India and accepted the Bible message in one, in one area. People who have never heard respond to God's voice in a way different, perhaps, than some of us do. The people of Nazareth wanted to see their sick healed too. But they also thought it was their right. They thought they were entitled. Why? Because they thought they owned Jesus. He grew up among them. They knew him. They knew his family. Because he had grown up among them and, and they had an entitlement to him. They were complacent and smug. They had, a, they had a reason for him wanting to see him come to Nazareth. They wanted to see some miracles, right? But see who this Jesus is. He didn't originate in Nazareth. He's the Lord of glory. He's the God of the Old Testament. He left heaven and came to this dark world. He's the creator of galaxies. On this point, we must read the Bible as it reads. And it was pure mercy of God that we're saved because of a God of love. I'd like to have you turn with me to Lamentations. You're all familiar with this passage. That's the little book that's right after Jeremiah. Easy to find if you know what is near. These are the Lamentations of Jeremiah. Some have thought and written that uh, he wrote Lamentations as a result of the death of King Josiah, the last good king of Judah. And uh, so he writes the Lamentations. Jeremiah's work was a, was a hard work. He talked about false prophets. He talked about Babylon coming down from the north and decimating their city. And, uh, you know, uh, Josiah, when he died, Jeremiah suffered greatly. But notice Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. We don't have a divine right to anything. We're, 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 the, we're, the, we're, the, we're the, the recipients of pure mercy, unmerited mercy, right? We need to look at, that, look at things that way. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Can't get my page to separate here. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. What a passage. Uh, learn to know where that's from. You'll use that again and again as you, as, you, as you work with people. Salvation is not a right. Just because we might think we are the remnant 
They thought they could command his powers at their discretion. Luke chapter 4, verses 26 and 27, we read about Elijah and Naaman, the Syrian king, or Syrian general. The people in Elijah's days were like that, divine rights. But where was Elijah sent when the famine was the greatest during that three and a half year period? To those who knew nothing. All the while, there were many widows going hungry in Judah. Who was healed of leprosy when there were lots of lepers in Israel? To one who knew nothing. Naaman, a government employee of the most hated enemy, the Syrians. And he was healed of his leprosy. Our great God rejected the idea and would not wear their yoke. I pray this morning that none of us are almost secure or almost persuaded, but altogether persuaded. Every one of us, if we think we have a claim on grace, that may be a big stone in our pathway. We don't want to begin thinking like the Jews of Christ's day, that Christ will cast an eye of favor upon us as others perish around us. Because God is no respecter of persons. God will do as he wills. I'm glad that he's a sovereign God, aren't you? And when I know about God's character, I'm more than glad that he is a sovereign God. It'd be a terrible thing if he was not a kind and merciful and and a, a God of love. His name is love. If he was not that and sovereign, it would be a bad thing, wouldn't it? What would we be into? But it's not that way. He's not a respecter of persons. God will do as as he wills, and righteously so, with his own. And publicans and harlots could go before us into the kingdom if we think we have a divine right to mercy. Remember, grace is unmerited favor. Laodicea is not aware of blind eyes and spiritual poverty that may afflict us. God's mercy is his sovereign gift, and he will populate with heaven those who are the poor in spirit, humble and thankful. These these are the ones that will see God. These will reign with him. I just love the promise made to Laodicea. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, I read it often in a Bible study. Revelation 3, verse 21. I have to tell you, I confess, I don't even know what it means. Verse 21 of Revelation chapter 3. I want you all to feast your eyes on this. To him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me where? In my throne, even as I am also overcame and am set down with his father, with my, with my father in his throne. Anybody know what that means? <laughs> I can't wrap my mind around that one somehow. The poor in spirit are the ones that are going to sit there with the Lord. This was a major subject in the teachings and preaching of Jesus. God says, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy, Right? I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I'm glad it's that way because he's the righteous God, perfect in all of his ways. Who are we then to judge our brother? Perhaps we need to enter our own closets, pour out our hearts before God and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. If that's our prayer, we're in a strong position with God so he can bless us with the dignity of his own love. We're in a strong position with God if that's our, yes, that's our attitude. When we, when we are smitten with adversity, then we can see the utter necessity of casting ourselves on him like Jacob wrestling with the angel. I won't let you go unless you bless me. Please, all of us, 
take up the position which grace accepts and go on to higher ground from here. We are our total welfare case. In constant need of strength. Beggars and such. In the matter of salvation, we cannot be choosers, but cast ourselves upon him. Jesus said, fall on the rock and be broken. I'm not sure I know in my own experience exactly what that totally means. But then he gave a little warning. He says, don't let the rock fall on you, right? Like the woman who at great effort is able to touch the hem of his garment. Oh, if I could just touch the garment. And we are at every moment in need of the same thing, the same virtue that comes only from him. Such become the sons and daughters, daughters of God. I pray that this whole congregation sees yourself in that way. Not beggars anymore, but as uh, was mentioned to us in the Sabbath school opening remarks this morning, friends, he counts us as his friends. Isn't that neat? I don't know what that means either. We haven't experienced friendship like that, right? That's a friendship that's higher than anything we've ever experienced. The idea of spiritual pride entered the church called Sardis, the fifth church in Revelation chapter 3. The time, 16th and 17th century. It was, it was post-Reformation. The great reformers were gone. Luther and Melanchthon and Baxter and, and uh, Calvin and, and Zwingli, they were all gone now, okay? The sons of the Reformation had lost the inspiration of salvation by faith through grace that came from the lips of Luther and his companions. They built large cathedrals, pomp and circumstance and liturgy and ceremonies before God, and people forgot the purest and simplest gospel. It was against this that great preachers like Whitfield and Spurgeon began to see a great religious awakening as they preached. And at this time, the great printing presses began to roll. Bibles were printed. Mission boards were set up. Bible societies were formed to distribute the wonders of God's grace to the world. Great religious awakening of the 18th century. All this paved the way for the Philadelphia church and brotherly love to whom is opened the door of God's sanctuary. Behold, I have set before you what? An open door into the very holy of holies in heaven. And God said, behold, I have set before you an open door, but with such great light for the world. Laodicean pride and blindness set in. Such a hopeful thing. Philadelphia, that was the church of the great disappointment. Within a few short years, the Laodicean blindness and nakedness began to settle in. Almost persuaded. That's where we are today. What will we do with the great light? that we have been given. Our challenge this morning is to spend time with God every day. To fall on the rock and be broken. Why do we study the Bible? Why do we spend time? Why do we, why do we talk about giving our hearts to Jesus? Why do we do that? For the purpose of knowing him. Whom to know is eternal life. Fall on the rock and be broken. Plead with God for humble and thankful hearts. And be ready when God calls. Believe and live. And perhaps we can benefit from the mistakes of Nazareth. So uh, this morning as we, as we sing our closing song, let's make it a heartfelt prayer. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling. What does it say? Amen. Don't pass me by. Okay. Our dear Father, you've heard our prayer this morning. We pray, Lord, that we have true hearts, sincere hearts, that we approach you, Lord, in a very sincere way each day. Lord, put it in our hearts to spend some time with you, to 
Make that our first work to give ourselves to you. I pray that you'll be with each one of us here today. Lord, I pray that none of my words are discouragement, but are an encouragement to us to higher ground, to a closer connection with you. And I pray that you'll be with each one today according to our several needs. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.